I need to start off this video by saying that I 100% enjoyed the movie Zootopia. I ended up seeing it like four times in theaters. First time I saw it, I loved it, then I took my nieces to go see it, then I got a free ticket to go see it again, then I took more friends to go see it afterwards. I enjoyed it every single time. Every time I saw it, I saw new things that I didn't see the previous time. This film is an absolute delight. This particular video is talking about one particular element, an element that I believe could have had a much more impactful message. Now, I'm not saying that the message we got was not satisfactory. It's actually quite beautiful. This small little tweak to the antagonistic force could have had that little nudge that could have landed us in a different direction and a different sort of theme that I feel would have had a much more appropriate message, one that would have spoken to more volumes of people of all ages. Now, I'm aware that there have been a lot of people who have tackled this idea before. I wrote this particular script on November 27th, 2016 at like 4.49 in the morning. Yeah, a lot of my ideas actually happen when I wake up from a fever dream. It happens more often than I care to admit. Other than that, I've kind of been sitting on this script for about 16 months now, and I really want to be able to like really talk about the movie that really got story surgery kind of rolling along in my head. With that being said, I want to take this time to remind you that I'm going to be talking about very heavy spoilers regarding the movie Zootopia, the plot from start to finish, as well as several plot points and ideas that could be implemented in a particular way. I wanted to give this heads up to you at the very beginning so that way there wasn't a flag like five minutes down the line that could have caught anybody off guard. Please take the time to enjoy Zootopia. It is worth the watch. It's a very well put together film tackling some very heavy issues that even are relevant to this day. Massive props go out to both of the directors for making this beautiful film. Gentlemen, you've done a very, very good job. With that being said, let us begin the intro and the episode. Name a good villain off the top of your head. Okay, okay, that's gonna be a little hard, so let's narrow it down. Name a good Disney villain off the top of your head. Most everyone will come up with a different answer for a multitude of reasons, because people tend to click with different villains for uh, many different ways. The character has an interesting arc, their backstory is relatable in some way, or how the villain is plagued with an internal conflict that drives the majority of their actions in such a way that it seems like they're a puppet to their own mischievous plans. Audiences like having a hero to root for, just as much as they like to have an antagonist that they can understand, because it adds weight to the film, which makes the event feel much more identifiable. And today, we're going to be talking about how a poorly explained villain can be the difference between a great movie and a mastered one. In March of 2016, Disney Animation released their newest animated feature, entitled Zootopia, and it wasn't long before this film was a massive success. Directed by Rich Moore and Byron Howard, Disney had yet again created an animated film that managed to emotionally enwrap people with its characters, close-to-home narrative, and was visually stunning to boot. The plot synopsis goes a little something like this. The modern mammal metropolis of Zootopia is a city like no other. Comprised of habitat neighborhoods like Sahara Square and Tundra Town, animals of every environment live together, a place where no matter what animal you are, you can be anything. But when rookie officer Judy Hopps arrives, she discovers that being the first bunny on the police force of big, tough animals isn't easy. Determined to prove herself, she jumps at the opportunity to solve a case of missing animals disappearing all over the city for unexplained reasons, even if it means partnering up with the fast-talking scam artist Fox Nicholas Wilde to uncover the secrets of what's going on in the shadows of Zootopia. It's a buddy cop film! <laughs> Realistically, it wasn't anything new in that department of storytelling. In fact, it's actually starting to slowly get into another topic of Disney movies falling into their own trend, being characters that don't like each other and have to go on an adventure, and they develop a friendship along the way. Eventually, the friendship gets tested, or there's a betrayal, but the friendship prevails, and they reach an ending together in harmony. Da -da 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 -da! 
Listen, I've been a huge movie person my entire life, and I gotta admit, I was scared going into Zootopia. I'm the type of person that wants to go in expecting a new story. I don't want to sit down and know what's going to happen. I want to feel anticipation because there was a turning point that I didn't see coming, or there was an element that brought back into play that I forgot to think about. A Chekhov's gun type plot twist. I love those. If this story was going to be exactly what I expected it to be, then why would I see this story at all? Why would I watch this? I'm somebody who literally has a Google spreadsheet of all of the Pixar films and basically has every single one of the stories side by side to prove how often the same plot point is used from movie to movie. I'm a little pedantic, and I realize that. Thankfully, this movie did surprise me, because what this story did differently was two key elements. First, this was an animated, anthropomorphic movie, something that Disney is well known for doing in the past, but it used the element in a strategic way, leading the second key element being that this story actually aims at a very topical issue that still runs within the world we know as today, being racism. With the movie being about animals, it really is about the race of an animal being pitted against another. It's both physical differences as well as the stereotype that's bound to each and every character within the story. When Judy enters the force of Zootopia, no one takes her seriously, not even her fellow colleagues who could be working alongside her. This was a way of tackling racism in such a way that it could be physically personified so that the audience as well as the characters within the film could see those thoughts and actions were th always there in the first place. The overall tone of this movie was fantastic in the idea of how it manages to highlight on a real-world issue while still maintaining a fictional world. Zootopia is a very well-made movie, and fans and critics highly recommend it to others who haven't watched it already. I've already said it before, but I'm saying it again. I adore this movie immensely. The moment I saw it, I was floored at how it was able to push boundaries that not other movies were willing to push just yet. But I realized that it manages to push it by using animation and a world without people to target an issue that is a very human issue. Overall, this movie did a very good job in establishing what it needed to to get the message it was trying to get across. However, there's a very particular reason why Zootopia is on my operating table today. A reason so particular it can be boiled down to one element. No, it can be boiled down to just one character. The character that was revealed to be the mastermind behind the antagonistic force that moves the story of Zootopia forward. One final time, everybody. Spoiler warning for this particular episode of Story Surgery. Right after this particular bumper here, we're diving right into the biggest plot reveal I could possibly do, basically revealing who the actual villain was. Just letting you know. Anyway, let us proceed. Very early on in the film, we are introduced to a multitude of characters that will reoccur throughout the entire story. Whether it be members of the police force that Judy meets on her first day, to the characters that she sees out on the streets that she'll meet up again to obtain information about the case that she's on, there's one character in particular who managed to pop out on the radar fairly soon after Judy was promoted to working in Zootopia. The assistant mayor of Zootopia, the small clumsy little sheep character known as Dawn Bellwether. We get the general idea of what her character is throughout the film every time that we see her on screen. She's willing to help out in any way that she can, but it's very apparent that because of who and what she is, she can sometimes not perform as accurately or as well as others would be able to. She's meek, she's small, and nobody really takes her seriously. Nevertheless, she never lets her spirits down and always manages to push forward, even helping Nick and Judy find out information about the case that they're tackling, why these animals are disappearing, and why the predator animals are going savage all over the city and reverting back to this primitive state causing all kinds of mayhem and damage to innocent members of society. After finding out a series of information that pits all of the blame on the current mayor of Zootopia, Mayor Lionheart, he is arrested and Bellwether is promoted to the head of Zootopia as the new mayor. When Judy blames all of the instances on predatory animals, her partner Nick, being a fox, gets offended and decides to leave, which breaks Judy's heart because she knew a barrier of trust was just shattered. After leaving the force, she goes back home, Judy finds information what was actually causing the predators to go savage, being a type of flower called Night Howlers, which can cause any animal to suddenly revert to a savage-like state. Yes, I am very aware that I'm zooming through this as fast as I possibly can, but you just watched the movie, so you probably still have this fresh in your mind. 
Judy reunites with Nick, apologizing for her thinking that predatory animals were the only ones responsible. The two of them rekindle their friendship. As soon as they do, they go out to find the source of where these night howlers are coming from. They find out that there's an underground group that's actually creating paintball-like ammunition filled with night howler extract and was targeting particular animals all over the city. After a scuffle with the thugs, Nick and Judy manage to get away with the evidence to prove that the predators of Zootopia are innocent. However, almost immediately after this climactic point in the film, it turns out that Bellwether is actually responsible for the extract getting made, and was hiring hitmen to target predators with the extract, making them seem like only predators were going savage. Bellwether explains everything in a typical villainous monologue. There's a switch up with some blueberries, our main characters foil Bellwether's plan, she's sent to jail. The truth is revealed! Nick and Judy are both officers and partners on the police force. Yay, happy endings. With that rundown out of the way, let's talk about Bellwether. Bellwether is... yeah, she's fine. She's introduced in an okay way and has a nice presence in the film as a whole, except for the whole main antagonist of the film, she realistically isn't explained that well. Heck, she really isn't explained at all, to be honest with you. When Nick and Judy are getting the lowdown as to what Bellwether's plan is for the city after all the predatory animals have been converted to savages. Ever notice that something's missing? Even though that she explains her plans, there's one thing that's never actually mentioned or addressed in the first place. Her motive. Plain and simply, why is Dawn Bellwether doing what she is doing? Some people might argue this point and say she's doing it to stop prey from being scared, or she's reuniting the prey against the predators, but that's not her motive. No one asks the question of all the animals in Zootopia, or even in this anthropomorphic world as a whole, why is Dawn Bellwether doing this? Why her versus the 90% of prey animals in the world. It's the biggest plot hole that really doesn't seem to make any sense as to why it's left out of the story, which results in Bellwether being yet another victim of the surprise villain train that has plagued cinema, Disney kind of being the running champion of this trope. A surprise villain is exactly what it sounds like. It's a more selective type of a plot twist where a character who was normally in the background and was a supporting character suddenly shows their true colors. For people who have watched other videos in this series, they know that this term is anagoriasis. It's somebody revealing who they actually are. In one case, it could be a character that seemingly was this friend character or was supporting character who rips off the mask and is now the antagonist and is wickedly evil at the flip of a switch and suddenly is against everything the heroes have been doing up until this point. As you can tell, I'm not a fan of this trope. My main problem with it is that it's so consistently overused. Disney films actually kind of being a prime suspect of this, that it's starting to sour my experiences when it comes to viewing these stories. The moment I believe a surprise villain is going to happen, I anticipate it, and the dread begins to show as I now await its arrival. And when it does, I'm actually annoyed. Honestly, in history, there have been really good surprise villains that, when you go back and watch the film for a second time, you're actually kicking yourself for not seeing it happen in the first place. Those are great villains because they catch you off guard, not in a shocking or unsuspected way, but because it was right under your nose the entire time. Two of the greatest examples would be Brian Singer's 1995 film The Usual Suspects and David Fincher's 1999 film Fight Club. I'm not going to spoil either of those films because one of them literally binds me from talking about it because it's in the rules. It's just the rules. If you want to know what those movies are about, go watch them for yourself. Getting back to Zootopia, I have thought about why proper backstory for Bellwether wasn't given in the final draft of the film. It might have increased the story's runtime, or would have added another element to a very heavily natured story to begin with, and it is completely understandable for that preliminary caution. Funnily enough, over on the Fixing Movies subreddit, that was something that was brought up pretty constantly, was the idea of if something like this was incorporated, it probably would have taken up too much time and possibly could have cut into the character development for Judy and Nick, or the complex story elements that were seen throughout the film. However, including a backstory for Bellwether would have actually opened up a whole new layer of dialogue within the narrative. Bellwether would have been a foil to our protagonists, Judy Hopps and Nick Wilde. 
For those unfamiliar for what the term a foil is, here's a brief breakdown. In storytelling, a foil is a character that shows qualities that are in contrast to another headlining character. Ideally, you'd have it be character B is usually the foil to character A. Character A being introduced first and character B in being introduced second. Character A usually being the protagonist with character B being the supporting character or even the antagonist. The objective of a foil is to highlight the traits and characters of the other. In Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and his friend Mercutio are foils of each other. Mercutio is a witty skeptic, is outgoing, and is cynical about romance, while Romeo is constantly falling in love, completely head over heels, loves talking about his feelings, and tends to keep to himself, very much shut in. Batman and the Joker are rivals, but they have a lot of similarities to who they are. Will Turner and Jack Sparrow are allies to each other, but Will is an honest man, while Jack is a, well, eyeliner pirate. Now, in Zootopia's story, Judy already has a foil that's introduced in the form of Nick Wilde. She's on the ball, is for the law, and fights for what is justified and is selfless in her acts. Nick is lackadaisical, constantly roughs up the law for his own gain, and is typically out for himself. They exist to drive home how much their partnered protagonist is what they are, the law bound versus the law breaker. There comes a time in the story when we learn that Nick is actually just like Judy in terms of their history of prey versus predator discrimination. They both have their history on the subject of discrimination and how they grew from that childhood experience establishes who they are as characters. We as the audience understand how this discrimination can grow. In Judy's case, she resisted it and found that it gave her strength to succeed. With Nick, he submitted to it and became the stereotype which allowed him to do what he wanted and pleased because it was just expected of him. So what about Don Bellwether? Bellwether could have actually been the third foil to our characters. While Judy became stronger because of the discrimination and Nick submitted to it to the stereotype, Bellwether could have become smarter because of her history with discrimination. Her backstory could be identical to Nick and Judy's. Bellwether, being a small sheep that she was, could have easily been a target for bullies, or the fact that she could have been the only sheep in her school, which meant that the constant attention that she didn't want, very much like how Nick had in his scenario. Heck, to make the backstory sting even more, you could even wager that she was probably the victim of physical abuse, very similar to how Judy was. While close to Judy and Nick in terms of story, Bellwether had one key difference. She found a way to use discrimination in her favor. She knew that no one was going to pay her any mind, because after all, what could a meek little sheep even do? With the right mindset and time, she could do a lot. Imagine this. She could be followed around by a bully, constantly shoving her, shoving her, shoving her day after day after day, until one day she realized that there was a system. There was a way that he always bullied. All she had to do was step out of the way one time and it caused a chain reaction. The bully suddenly falls into a jock and that jock causes a whole other situation that allows Bellwether to just slip away completely unharmed. If we take into consideration that sheep have a flock mentality, that means that Bellwether would probably surround herself with individuals who gave her an advantage befriending characters she knew would lift her up and away from the discrimination she was used to. It's not an evil motive, it was her ability to self-sustain, to form the best ways of getting through every single day while getting to know her surroundings. Coming back to the story of Zootopia, this would give a driving force as to why Bellwether would be doing what she's doing. She could even mirror what Nick said at near the beginning, explaining that she has been strategizing her whole life. It wouldn't be any surprise if they looked up and found out that Bellwether ended up becoming the ASB president of every school she's ever attended because she was very, very good at adapting to her environment and getting people's good side to play into her own abilities to survive and sustain. Now, there are a couple of you that are thinking that this is pretty deep for an anthropomorphic Disney character to be in a story sense. And yeah, you are you are 100% correct. But the fact of the matter is, this was the entire premise behind Zootopia's story, and yet the opportunity to illustrate another perspective was lost. The audience 
is just supposed to write off that Bellwether is this mustache twizzling villain who came out of flippin' nowhere and curses the heavens when their plan doesn't follow through, waggling their fist at the heroes as they're shipped off to jail for their crimes. In a film rich with characterization, this is such a missed opportunity for storytelling because we don't and can't connect with this villain. We as the audience should understand why a plot-centric character is doing what they're doing, otherwise the movie just loses a chance to, to deliver the whole story. Now I know for a fact that this is a thing that most people have thought about, because I've actually read about it on the subreddit Fixing Movies, which I love you guys by the way, and I'm sure this is the same issue that some producer people are probably thinking the same thing. How could someone plan on inserting this much information and not just obliterate the runtime of this film. Better yet, how can you make someone in this story kid-friendly in a Disney sort of way in a film that already is filled with discrimination abuse and being subjected to stereotyping via physical violence? Well, it's actually really easy. We rephrase what Bellwether says at the museum at the end of the movie and give her a very distinct character shift when information is being presented to her and the main characters, i.e. the audience. Instead of Bellwether just explaining the numbers of prey to predators and the extent of the Night Howler plan, Bellwether gives her backstory to explain why she's doing what she's doing. You can intercut this with flashbacks, but I don't actually think that's necessary. We already have Nick and Judy's backstories to fuel this. The both of them know exactly what she's talking about. You could use the visual representation for audiences, but I don't think it's necessary. Here's our pre-op for this movie. To make very clear as to what you do and what's about to happen, I'm not going to change the overall feeling of this movie. 90% of what this movie is is going to stay the exact same. We're mainly going to shift what what'll happen at the very end when Bellwether is revealing her plan. As well as add one or two scenes earlier to help better understand why this explanation is given. One little tiny thing I want to add as a characterization of Bellwether as an individual is maybe she has like a tick that she has. Maybe every time she gets spooked by something she always does the same thing. She brings both of her hands up to the side of her head and maybe that grabs onto her ears. Maybe it's a trait from when she was younger. Maybe it was something that relates to something that bullies did to her when she was younger. It's something that has still managed to stick with her all this time, and it is something that we can use to our advantage when crafting how this ending will play out. Additionally, and this really does kind of stem from my whole problem with surprise villains as a whole, if you're going to have somebody who does have this emotional connection to characters that they can't relate with or they have a hatred for that kind of character, it really needs to come out in some kind of way. Now I'm not saying that she has to openly always be aggressive around predators, but maybe she can't look them directly in the eye most of the time. Maybe for a while she had a hard time really looking at Nick directly at his face, always just kind of glancing at him but never actually making any kind of eye contact. Perhaps she she starts having a different feeling about Predators when she realizes that Nick is doing as much as he is to help Judy figure out this problem. A small scene that can be added right before we begin our main operation is when Judy goes to Mayor Bellwether's office. Perhaps Judy walks in and sees that Bellwether is watching a report on how many innocent animals are now being hurt all over the city. A look of distress on her face as she watches in silence. When Bellwether realizes that she's not alone anymore, she immediately turns off the broadcast and turns her attention back to Judy, in which case they start by talking about Judy becoming the face of the Zootopia Police Department. It doesn't last very long and it ends exactly the same way as it does in the film, but it's a small little thing that shows that she doesn't seem concerned, she seems distressed by something, something other than just these animals being hurt. Apart from that, everything in this film stays exactly the same. The big change comes when Nick and Judy are having the Night Howler extract as evidence and they're heading to the Natural History Museum and through it to see if they can't get to the police precinct to deliver this evidence. It is here we begin our operation. Moments after being caught up by Bellwether, Nick and Judy explained that they have all the evidence they need to prove that the Predators are innocent, and all of this was because this serum was causing them to go savage. A look of astonishing relief come over Bellwether's face as she congratulates both Nick and Judy for being able to get this information and procure all this evidence. Bellwether slips, saying out loud, 
this was all getting out of hand. And I, to think that these night howlers were causing innocent people to get hurt and the fact that uh, it just had to stop. In the moment she spends catching her breath, both Nick and Judy freeze. Bellwether looks at both of them, wondering why they look so stern. Judy slowly asks Bellwether how she could have known that what was in the case was night howlers. The room goes quiet. There's a pause. Bellwether slowly raises her hands. Her eyes dart back and forward between Nick and Judy, and she says, Let me explain. Nick and Judy turn toward the exit door, seeing that it's blocked by a guard. Run! They both blurt out, and the pair bolt away from Bellwether and begin to run through the museum. Bellwether, beginning to breathe heavily out of fear, yells at her guards to go make sure that Nick and Judy don't get away. The two guards run after Nick and Judy. Bellwether begins to pace on the spot, tapping her fingers together, quietly whispering to herself, No, 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 not now. Nick and Judy run through the Natural History Museum. Judy ends up hurting her leg, and the two of them have to hide as the guards begin searching for them. Nick and Judy have a quick back and forward of what they could do to get out of there with the information that's needed when they hear Bellwether call out to them. It was never meant to go this far. This has all got so out of hand. There's so many things that no one pays attention to, and I couldn't stand by and do nothing. Seeing so many predators in a position of power over others, that's just cruel. It needed to be addressed. I didn't want anyone to go through the same thing that I did. Being thought of as weak, to be pushed around because I'm not as strong as the ones doing the pushing, to be hurt by someone because they knew I couldn't fight back. Nick and Judy stare off into the distance. They knew exactly what Bellwether was talking about because they had went through the same thing themselves when they were younger. Bellwether walks into an exhibit of predators and prey coming together. The sign for the exhibit reads, A New Beginning. She fidgets with her hands and stares at the exhibit. I wanted to show that no one was without fault. By showing that predators had just as much of a flaw as prey had, it would mean that we could move forward as equals, rather than living this lie that there's equality when there isn't, and no one even questions it. I needed to change that, but when I found out that innocents were getting hurt, I just, I needed to. Bellwether's words are cut short when a guard yells out, Over there! Nick and Judy bolt from their hiding place, and they're confronted by the guards, and Nick and Judy are knocked into the exhibit that goes into the floor, causing the case to go out of Nick's hands, and the Nighthower bullets and the gun fly out of the pit. Nick and Judy panic as they look around, looking for some kind of exit. They look up to see Bellwether standing at the top of the exhibit, holding the Night Howler gun in her hand. Bellwether stares down at Nick and Judy, her eyes darting between them, a look of absolute fear on her face. This wasn't supposed to happen. Bellwether says, gesturing with her hands, fumbling with the gun, staring down at Nick and Judy in the pit. She shakes her head and brings her empty hand to the side of her head. What should we do, Mayor? One of the guards asks quietly. Bellwether remains silent as she stares down into the pit, her breathing becoming exaggerated as her panic begins to increase. Hey, hey, look. Nick starts to speak, standing up and moving towards the wall that Bellwether stands atop of. It's, it's okay, it's all right. Look, things get out of hand all the time. Sometimes a plan doesn't go the way you imagined it. That's how we move forward. Bellwether stares down at Nick, remaining silent as he inches closer to the wall. Nick looks at Judy and helps Judy to her feet. Judy stares at Nick for a moment before looking up at Bellwether. We're all capable of moving forward, Judy says to Bellwether, limping from her injured leg. Moving past what has hurt us in our past. Nick and I both know what that's like to be hurt and... Bellwether's fear immediately dissipates, a look of anger coming over her once panicked face. She steps forward and drops down into the pit with Nick and Judy. She slowly walks towards them, beginning to raise the Night Howler gun towards them. Don't you dare, Bellwether says in a furious tone. Don't you dare try to make me think anyone could imagine what I went through. No one could even... Judy opens her mouth to say something, but Nick steps in front of her, blocking Bellwether's aim. Bellwether stops right in front of Nick and looks up at him. I don't have to imagine, Nick says, looking down at Bellwether. I know exactly what that's like. How could you possibly know? Bellwether starts angrily speaking, but stops as Nick drops to his knees. His eyes are now level with Bellwether. Her expression changes to surprise as Nick's face fills with sadness. He looks down at his own hands. I know what it's like to be stared at as a thing rather than who I am. To be placed in a category because of what I am. To be shut down from doing things because I'm different from others. Nick looks up from his hands at Bellwether. 
to be muzzled by animals I called friends because they wanted to remind me of who I was. Bellwether's eyes water as she stares at Nick. Judy moves out from behind Nick and moves towards Bellwether, the gun in Bellwether's hand quivering as it slowly begins to lower. No one believed that I could reach my goals, Judy says, stopping next to Bellwether. There were some who wanted me to know that I was chasing dreams I'd never see. Judy reaches forward and takes Bellwether's empty hand and places it on her face. Some of them left scars. Bellwether feels the scars on Judy's cheek. The tears in Bellwether's eyes run down her face as she pulls her hand away from Judy, taking a sharp breath. She looks down at the Night Howler gun in her hand. Nick reaches out and places a hand on Bellwether's shoulder. You're not alone, he says. We'll take a pause here to discuss this change and why I'm doing it. I'm sure some of you are wondering why I've made these select changes. This change to Bellwether's character as an antagonist does two things. One, it allows both Nick and Judy to understand the situation at hand and what Bellwether's motive is. Secondly, and this part is really important, it allows us, the audience, to understand that Bellwether's story is nearly identical to Nick and Judy's. It hits harder when realizing that Judy's discrimination of physical abuse and Nick's emotional abuse, Bellwether was a victim of both physical and emotional abuse. We can relate with this character on an emotional level just like Nick and Judy, while having a justifiable reason as to why Bellwether's actions are what they are. As the slugline of this particular episode suggests, Zootopia didn't need a villain to wrap up the conflict. It could have used another character that was similar in backstory to what we've grown attached to. This allows us to look at Don Bellwether and say, she's just like them. And that's what this story could have used, one final angle to show how these three characters, with all similar backgrounded experiences, have let discrimination mold them into who they are. Nick and Judy had their moment earlier in the film that made them realize their similarities, so when they see and find that Bella there is like them, it's not about overpowering her, it's about making her understand that she's not alone, and she doesn't need to feel alone. We jump back into our operation. The scene continues. I've done so many things, I, I don't know where to begin, Bellwether says, wiping the tears from her face. We'll figure it out, Judy says. From behind all of them, a guard drops down into the pit and approaches and places a hand on Bellwether's shoulder. In that a moment of emotion, Bellwether wasn't ready for someone to sneak up on her like that. She jumps, bringing her hands to her head as she lets out a little yelp. In that moment, her grip on the Night Howler gun tightened, and with that, the gun goes off. There's a pause as all three characters look over to watch as the guard falls onto the floor, the purple mark of the Night Howler serum embedded into the bottom of his face. Nick, Judy, and Bellwether watch as the guard begins to shiver. Oh no, Bellwether whispers. The guard rolls over and stands on all fours, his eyes have dilated and is breathing heavily. The guard looks at all of the others on the other side of the pit. He charges at them. They proceed to duck and weave around the exhibit to get away from this now savage ram. Judy having a hard time getting out of the way from her injured leg. When she falls down, Nick pivots on the spot and runs to her. The ram stops and grinds its foot into the ground, getting ready to charge. Bellwether calls out to the ram, causing it to turn towards her. She's standing in front of a patch of tall grass over a small rock, and she's waving her arms, shaking the Night Howler gun violently, making a loud clacking noise. The ram snorts and rears up and begins to charge. Nick and Judy call out to tell Bellwether to get out of the way. She shakes her head. Not yet, she whispers as the ram gets closer. Right as the ram is only inches away, she leaps forward over the charging ram, who plows into the tall grass and crashes into the wall of the exhibit. The impact's strong, knocking over all the mannequins in the exhibit. Even the ceiling seems to rumble. The ram is knocked cold, falling limp to the floor. Nick, Judy, and Bellwether look down at the ram as ZPD police show up and surround the exhibit. The scene cuts to a newscast, detailing of how the former mayor, Bellwether, admitted to the Night Howler attacks within Zootopia. Doctors find a treatment for the Night Howlers, and the savage animals are returned to normal. 
So why did I change this little bit of dialogue in scenes at the very end? Well, it actually serves as a metaphor, a great irony to the situation at hand. The antagonist wasn't actually a character, but was an ideal that took physical shape within the story. The Night Howlers were the cause of all the turbulence throughout Zootopia, and went so far as to turn Prey savage, both highlighting the point that Judy makes earlier that Prey can't go savage, therefore disproving that idea, and actually showing how it can physically happen happen, as well as serving a point of irony for Bellwether. Being a member of her own species, being a sheep, in this case a ram, becomes the very thing that she's set to remove from society. An antagonistic force gone savage. From this we mostly leave the ending alone. Judy's speech about trying to make the world a better place and how change begins with everyone, you keep all of that the same. It's a very powerful speech, and it matches up very nicely with everything established in Zootopia throughout the narrative. Now this last scene I'm going to propose may turn some people off, but I feel like it actually would add good emotional closure for our three characters we've come to understand so far. It's a short scene, showing that Bellwether, who is still in prison attire, is with Nick and Judy. All of them are sitting in a round circle of chairs, all of them having a shirt with a sticker on it that says, Hello, my name is, with their names written underneath, and they're sitting underneath a sign above them that just reads, We are not alone. Bellwether looks around the circle to see that everyone is different. Both prey and predators are sitting in this circle. Nick and Judy encourage her to stand up. She looks at both of them. They both nod. Bellwether takes a deep breath before turning to the circle and begins to speak. Realistically, this scene doesn't actually need any dialogue. You could actually still have Judy's speech going over top of this because it's very much a visual interpretation of what's being done here. It adds closure to the emotional element of Zootopia. Now, you have all three foil characters coming to terms with what they share, and how they, as characters, can grow as one. I feel like some people would disagree with me adding the scene into this movie, thinking that it weakens a character from the strong role model that they are, but for me, the reason why I think that I would want to include this is to show that even strong characters are willing to sit down and open up. Being able to talk about something so personal like this to someone else of a different kind, it shows a strength that most movies don't really tackle all that often. This is mostly due to the idea that opening up about things shows a negative Side. This character's supposed to be a role model, and they're not supposed to be sensitive. But that is really kind of weird, because having characters willing to sit down and open up about what they have, and what kind of advice they could give to other people who have had similar experiences, it's one of the many steps that these characters can take to really move forward. I'm very passionate about storytelling, and Zootopia was one of my favorite films from 2016, not because it was Disney or that I have a soft spot for animated features. <coughs> it's because this was so awesome to have a genre film so particular and use it as a tool for highlighting the emotional topic that most films shy away from. It took the idea of race and dialed it up to a thousand, cleverly using physical attributes to stand in for what most people would describe as characterization. It handles the emotional side of things in such a way that you would never expect it from an animated feature filled with anthropomorphic animals. The surprise villain was extremely unneeded for the story and having an antagonistic force rather than a character means that this emotional connection with this third foil would have had a much more impactful tone for the very end. We might not get the story that we want at all times, but with better structure for our storytelling ability, we as audiences as well as story writers should always be willing to try everything. Ah. Oh boy, this was a tricky video to edit, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, everything about this seemed to have constantly been run into the ground, constantly over and over and over again. I'm here now, so I suppose that's kind of a positive point, but man oh man, uh, if anybody follows my Twitter, I gave the numbers of how many times things had crashed, how many times things got locked up, and how many times I basically just kind of put my hands together and just prayed that what I was doing was just going to work. That being said, I want to thank you all very much for watching and getting to this point of the video. 
I'm really somebody who absolutely enjoyed Zootopia, and I thought that by making this video, this idea that really sparked story surgery to happen at all was kind of the way to show that I think with this one little tweak that they could have done, this movie could have been a mastered experience for all ages. I also want to give a shout out to the several people, several hundred people even, who have shared my video on Sonic Forces around. Thank you very much, and I'm so happy that people are getting the artistic, creative bursts to do something with my ideas. That being said, thank you all very much for watching. I'm EPC379, and I'll see you for the next operation.